This podcast is brought to you by Most Valuable Podcasts, leading the league in podcasting entertainment. What's up, what's up? Real MVPs, Ricky Widmer here, along with the Mark Weber. To the knees. And we are back for another edition of the Onside Kick right here on Mosville Podcast, your pro football podcast for MVP. And Mark, we're chugging along. I know we're recording these out of order, so this would be, oh, this is the one, we're recording them out of order, but this is the one that would be for this week, the week before cool. um, July 4th, so... For every one of our fans in the U.S., a happy early July 4th, as you'll probably see this a day or two before, and then the rest of the videos you'll see on July 4th. But we move on in our previews to the NFC West. We've done with the North, done with the South. Now it's starting the West, and we start with the NFC. If you're new to our previews, we start with the worst. We go to the first. So it's going to be Cardinals, then the 49ers, then the Seahawks, and then we end with the Super Bowl runner-ups, um, the Los Angeles Rams, who probably shouldn't have been in the Super Bowl, but that's a story for another day. Sorry, mm-hmm. Saints fans, that I have to bring it up again. But how we work in these previews is before, actually, before we get into that, patreon.com backslash most valid podcast. We actually have a new patron, there you go. Charlie Dunning, so I want to throw some love his way. He has joined us at the bronze tier which is just $1, and he's going to get access to the MVP podcast where we're going to record episode three mm-hmm. today after this, a very special episode of It'll the MVP fun podcast. One, you, one I definitely think you guys want to <laughs> check out. It'll keep you very informed and in the loop. Yes, it will. And uh, he's going to be able to see that a month mm-hmm. before everyone else, as well as get access to our Discord channel, which yeah. Retro, Jake, Pat was texting in it today. Um, Sung Hyung texts in it all the time. A lot of basketball Thro- stuff. Throwing right links now. in there. And that's the thing. More mm-hmm. people get in there, more different interests. And as come always, alive. please, if you're a football <laughs> fan, get in that Discord chat because I do not care at all about basketball. Soapy's got your gaming down. Yeah. He, he he hits up Mark with the gaming, but he's a good man. Mark is like, I need some football people. I need some Seriously. football people in here. Um, but let's start. With the worst team in the NFC West. In the NFL. (laughs) In the NFL. They were the number one draft pick. The Arizona Cardinals. And what we do to begin everything is kind of run down the stats and everything. And Mark, you said they were the worst. Well, they were the worst in offense, period. Offensive yards per game, 32nd in the league. Just over 241 yards on offense. They were last in points. Just over two touchdowns a game. 32nd in the league. Defense, they were a little bit better, but not great. Um, Yards per game, they were 20th overall, 358 yards per game given up, and 26th in defensive points per game, just over 26 points given up by their defense. If we look at the free signings or the free agent signings and re-signings so far for the Cardinals this offseason, they bring in Tremaine Brock to a one-year deal. They make a trade with the Steelers. They bring in Marcus Gilbert on the offensive line. They sign Jordan Hicks to a four-year deal, boosting that defense. The biggest signing, I think, Brett Hundley to be that backup Mm -hmm. um, to Kyler Murray. But they also bring in guys like Kevin White, off injured, um, but sign him to a one-year deal. And one of the biggest ones, they bring in Terrell Suggs to a two-year deal over from the Ravens. And, of course, draft pick-wise, they make the big noise. Um taking Kyler Murray with the number one overall pick. They also got other guys like Andy Isabella. I really liked Hakeem Butler to boost the wide receiving core. But with this team, Cliff Kingsbury comes in. This will be his first year as head coach of the Arizona Cardinals. He gets his quarterback in Kyler Murray. The biggest thing was this offensive line last year. Yeah, Is it going to be it better? Terrible. Is it going to be better for Kyler Murray? But I want to ask you... What are your thoughts offensively? We'll start there with mm. this offense with Cliff P- Kingsbury coming in, yeah. new quarterback coming in, and not a great offense last season. Here's the first thing I, I need to get to. We both agree, and I'm sorry, Cardinals fans, mm-hmm. bear with me for a second before you exit out of this video. Uh, you, We would both agree in this room that the Arizona Cardinals were the worst team in football last year, right? 
Absolutely. And you'd have to be a pretty shitty team to lose to the Arizona Cardinals last year, right? Absolutely. Just like the Green Bay Packers did okay. when they lost Week 13, 20-17. I thought you were going to throw uh, the Vikings. Like I was like, shit, did the Vikings, no, the Vikings lose to the Cardinals? Lose. Uh, <laughs> no, but, uh, you know, Green Bay Packers, mm-hmm. you guys lost to the worst team in football. I just want to put it out there. Uh, <laughs> you know, so did the San Francisco 49ers uh, twice, but we're talking about Green Bay here. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so anyway, Super Bowls, uh, or Super Bears, Super Bowl. So with that being said, this offense worries me. Mm-hmm. And I think that Kyler Murray, I, I've had my opinion set on Kyler Murray quite often, so the odds are I'm going to be terribly wrong on it now, mm-hmm. right? Uh, because I'm very anti-Kyler Murray. And the reason why, he's someone who took a long time to actually be committed to football. But I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to assume that he is fully committed to football. Mm -hmm. Even though there's a little part of me that really thinks the first time things get difficult, he's going to say, so about that baseball contract. Mm -hmm. Um, The reasons I'm really concerned for Kyler Murray is he's a small guy. And I'm not saying that he can't play quarterback. All right, he'll be fine to play quarterback. What I'm concerned about is when he faces a real defense, which, I don't know, you're the college football guy. Mm -hmm. Is there such thing as a real defense in the Big 12? No. Big 12 don't play defense. Exactly. So when he faces a real defense <laughs> like, in the NFL. Like that was the running joke between Brandon and I for the longest time was that's why you get like the 56 to 52 games in the Big 12 because all spread offense, no right? defense. Well, you know, the coaches just say, uh, who we got? Uh, you know what? I don't care. Go out there. <laughs> play whatever position you want. It's fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's all about the defense. You know, I'm looking at a game like week two, you know, when they play – the uh, and we'll get into the schedule later, yeah. but when they play the Ravens, mm-hmm. you know, like the second best when he defense, gets that first look at a real NFL defense, yeah. Um, and yes, I am throwing a really some good shade NFL on, on the Detroit Lions on this one, mm-hmm. uh, but that's gonna hurt. And then he goes to you know, then he'll play the Panthers and then the Seattle Seahawks, mm-hmm. so he's gonna play some good defenses. If this offensive line cannot protect him like they were not able to protect Josh Rosen. And I know there's some shuffling going on here, but they were not able to protect Josh Rosen last year. He was sacked way too many times, way too quickly. Kyler Murray is going to break in half. Mm -hmm. And you bring up Brett Hundley. Um, Yeah, Brett Hundley. I had to double check and make sure that was the right backup quarterback. Uh, He might actually be playing next year. He Mm -hmm. might have to. Um, So that's a concern I have. But Kyler Murray... Those are some things I'm worried about, but he can do it kind of on his own, too. Yeah. Like, he can make stuff happen. Well, and that's why they drafted him, where they, like, Mm -hmm. they, being the Cardinals, are hoping that he could maybe be, like, a Russell Wilson-esque, I'm going to say. And I know people are going to say that's a big name to live up to, but they're hoping that he's going to be that Russell Wilson, that if it does break down on the offensive line, Mm -hmm. he can either run around in the backfield, still make a throw, or, like, I go back to the West Virginia game, it broke down, he scrambled out to the left, and just whoosh, right up the sideline for, like, a 51-yard touchdown. Exactly. So, there's potential there um, to to not, you know, I don't I don't want to rag on Kyler Murray, mm-hmm. um, because I don't want Arizona Cardinal fans to think I'm hoping he's bad. I'm not hoping he's bad, I just mm-hmm. don't think he was worth a first-round pick. Um which will be my big hot take if he becomes a huge superstar and then people yeah. can yell at me about it. Uh, whatever. But, you know, I am I look at Cliff Kingsbury. He is another big mm-hmm. red flag. I mean, he is com- this is a complete boomer bust. Went to lunch with Charlie McVay. Yeah, he did, which is great. Uh, <laughs> you know, they text it every once in a while. Um, you know, Kyler Murray will be a boomer bust quarterback. Cliff mm-hmm. Kingsbury, that's a boomer bust coaching hire. Yeah. So they're they're going all in, which is great. Good for them. It's like if you ever played online poker uh, or anybody mm-hmm. who ever played online poker on Facebook or something like that, and you, you go into one of these tournaments, everybody gets a 1,000 chips right to begin with. There's eight of you. Mm-hmm. And uh, all right, you're ready to play. And five people at the table have all gone all in. Why? Because they can. It doesn't matter. It's not real money. They're just going for it and hoping for the best. Mm-hmm. And that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but I feel like that's the thing here. It's, hey, you know what? We're pushing the chips in. We had a terrible season last year. We've had a rough time since Bruce Arians is no longer our coach. We got to go and we got to make a splash. Cliff Kingsbury is that is that option. They're going for it. So I want to talk about this offense mm-hmm. because, you know, there's a 
great article on, on ESPN where they're trying to figure out what are the few key pieces we know about this offense so far. The answer is not very much, and some of it conflicts with each other. Um, what we supposedly know so far is that they're going to use the shotgun a lot. Um, whether it is the 99% of the time that some people have said, or it's just more often than not, they're going to run shotgun a lot. Yeah. Why is that important? Kyler Murray is going to be a lot more comfortable in that. It's not a Mitch. That's what he ran in college. Yeah, it's not a Mitch Trubisky. Hey, spend some time learning how to take snaps under center. Mm-hmm. It's this is what he's good at. Let's just do well, it. And the thing I want to interject with about the offense really quickly is Kyler Murray to me. When it comes to the Cliff Kingsbury system, mm-hmm. he's the linchpin to me. If it's yeah. going to all stay together, it's because of Kyler Murray. If it's all going to fall apart, it's because of Kyler Murray. And the reason why I say that is I am on the side with Cliff Kingsbury that I do not think Mm -hmm. his tenure with the Cardinals is going to be very good. Because with him personally as a head coach, I look at it and go, let me look at your time at Texas Tech. And it wasn't. From 2013 Bad, to 2018, here were the records. And I'll mm-hmm. do overall because conference doesn't matter yeah. from college to NFL. 8-5, and 4-8, and 7-6, 5-7, 6-7, 5-7. And and seven, and seven, and seven. So besides that first year, which I'll be honest, that first year, usually with a head coach, you put a line through it. Because mm-hmm. it's like, these aren't your recruits. They're the recruits that yeah. we had previously and usually it's not until like year three, year four. So 2015, 16 for him that you see like, hey, what's this team look like? And win loss, the team was never good. But offensively. That's the here, big key that and, the Arizona Cardinals are looking at. And here's the thing. His first two years, they were, and this is throughout all of um, FBS, they were 23rd and 55 in 2013, 2014. But in 2015-16, they were the second-ranked offense and the fifth-ranked offense before falling back down to 23rd and 16th. Here's the thing that's important. Who did Cliff Kingsbury have those two years he was second and fifth at Texas Tech? Patrick Mahomes. Yeah. He had the right quarterback. And Patrick Mahomes has proven and that's now what they're in the hoping NFL to go that, for. hey, I'm really good. That's what they're hoping for with Kyler mm-hmm. Murray. The question is, can Kyler Murray be the same thing to Cliff's offense that Mahomes was in college? And, and that's an important distinction, too, because with the uh, with Patrick Mahomes, mm-hmm. and you're talking about shotgun, that's 80% yeah. of the time. They're hoping for that type of success. A couple things I want to go into. So mm-hmm. I like that part. That's something I like. Yes, play to the strengths of your ro- young rookie. Make it easy on him. Um this is the part that concerns me, mm-hmm. and it reminds me of a certain somebody, and I think that uh, for everybody playing the game at home, you'll be able to figure it out pretty quickly who this mm-hmm. reminds me of. This offense is going to be fast-paced. Yeah. It's going to be up-tempo. They're hoping to run above 80 plays a game. Are we going to get a Chip Kelly reference? Exactly. This is Chip Kelly all over again. Chip is, Kelly is... Is Cliff going to moderate how many hours his players are sleeping? They're going to have heart monitors on right? during practice. We're going to only this is run what you can 15, eat. This is what you can eat. Only going to use 15 seconds of the play clock. We're going to go and go and mm-hmm. go. And what happens? Players get too tired. They get injured. And it doesn't actually work. Mm-hmm. The goal is great, but it doesn't actually happen. Um... And, you know, ESPN did a good job looking at the average play time and whatever for, no, for teams. He, I don't care. I'm not going to get into that. Here's but. a question I just want to throw out there because I mm-hmm. don't know the actual answer to this, but maybe someone out there does or you know. Um, is it that that fast-paced no huddle works better in college because you're dealing with, what, early 20s to like mm-hmm. late teens kids? Yeah. Whereas in the NFL, you could be dealing with someone who's in their 30s. Yeah, tend to and be like, dealing with a guy who's 40. When you get 30, 40, it's like, dude, I can't fucking, I can't fucking go the mm-hmm. way I could when I was well, 21. Your your defensive players oftentimes are larger, mm-hmm. and even offensive linemen are larger than they were in college. Look yeah. at a Big 12 defensive lineman mm-hmm. or an offensive lineman; they're not the size of an NFL lineman. Mm-hmm. So that 
definitely goes into it as well. Um, and the conditioning is just a little bit different as well. Um, and there's a lot going on. You know, part of the thing, too, in a college offense, it's, all right, guys, run down the field. Patrick Mahomes, throw the ball to one of them. Mm-hmm. Awesome. You know, and they have their gimmicky things. They have their signs. In the NFL, there's a lot. It's not that they don't analyze in college, but there's a lot more of that chess game going on between coaches a lot of times, too. You can't move that fast. You're going to make mistakes, Mm -hmm. you know, um, in that case. So that's one that really concerns me is what is that balance going to be between how fast they're trying to run, how often they're going no huddle. Sometimes for a rookie quarterback, no huddle is nice. Because they don't get in their own head. You don't have they to just, think about anything. Exactly. It's just, in, it's just, hey, this is what I'm used to. I can go it's off of muscle playing, memory. Playing football in the park. Mm-hmm. You know. But more um, of the NFL is like you look at Tom Brady and it's what do you do? Like in the NFL, you always hear the analysts say it's not what you do after the ball is snapped. It's what you do before the ball is snapped. Exactly. Look at Peyton Manning. Mm-hmm. He Tom uses Brady. every second. Of that play clock. There was that one game, was it Manning versus Lewis or Brady versus Ray Lewis, Mm -hmm. where it was, I think it was um, Peyton Manning when he was on the Broncos. Like, Peyton would change something, you'd see then Ray change something. And then Omaha, Omaha, you'd see Peyton Mm -hmm. change it right back. And then Ray Lewis would change. It it was like a little chess match that they had, and then it was like, oh shit, we gotta hike the ball now. Exactly. Um, So you're trying to do little things. Uh, obviously this is going to be kind of a spread offense. They're looking to spread. I don't know if it's a pure spread offense, but they're going to try and spread out. They're going to try and use all the field, um, which is great in college. The harder thing, it's not impossible to spread. Obviously plenty of teams can manage it in, in college. I mean, I'm sorry, in the NFL, but it's a little bit of a narrower playing field in the sense of just the hash marks. Mm -hmm. So Cliff Kingsbury has to adjust to that. We'll see how he does in that part. Um, and then this is the interesting one. We're all expecting, and we're all guilty of this, I think, Kingsbury's offense to be all about Kyler Murray throwing the ball. Yeah. But he's saying that this is going to be a balanced offense, mm-hmm. that they will be running the ball. I personally don't really buy it, but this is what they're saying is going to happen. Well, and that's a, that's one of the questions I have about the offense, too, is – you're not going to have it just be Kyler Murray. Mm-hmm. And when you have a guy like David Johnson back there, like, yes, you can use Assuming David Johnson. actually jo- there. You can use David Johnson as a receiver, but David Johnson to me isn't that back to where it's like you're a pure receiver out of the backfield. He yeah. is one where it's like you have David Johnson back there, you might want to use him because that's a guy that could, like, healthy, mm-hmm. a thousand yard rusher every single year. Like, yeah. that's the potential he has when healthy. The and question if you're is, using him, will he be healthy? Yeah, so it's interesting. Another thing that's very interesting to me is talking about how they want it to seem more complicated than it is, mm-hmm. which is an interesting one. They want to trick the defense. Basically. Yeah, I think that can be an interesting idea. Uh, it also can really backfire in your face Mm. i think to use chicago uh i think matt Nagy has seen it backfire in his face multiple times Mm -hmm. where he was trying to be too complicated trying to be too tricky trying to be too cute yeah don't be cute sometimes you just hand the ball off to your running back and you run up the middle it's like um has you know russell wilson and Pete carroll about it's like i had a gym teacher in high school he would say Mm -hmm. it all the time he goes guys no matter what it is in life just think of the four the one letter one word kiss Keep it simple, stupid. There you go. That's and all you and honestly, sometimes. yeah, honestly, it's the sometimes the simplest option is going to be your best option. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this can be interesting. I, like I said, I feel like this is very boom or bust. There's going to be a lot of criticism either way because the number one overall quarterback that had a lot of question marks to him. Mm-hmm. It's a coach that had a huge amount of question marks to him when they hired him. If it works out, they look like geniuses. If it doesn't, everyone's going to point and say, we told you so. Why'd you get rid of Josh Rosen? Mm -hmm. Told you. Um, So it's going to be very interesting, but it's also the kind of thing where this is a completely different kind of team, really. New coach, new quarterback, trying to fix the offensive line, trying to keep um, some of those older guys and injured guys, you know, Fitzgerald, Johnson, trying to keep them together. Um some pieces of the defense that are gone now. 
it's a very different looking team, and it's not a team that's just going to suddenly become a Patrick Mahomes or a Baker Mayfield led team and just suddenly be awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a team that's going to take a slower amount of time to be ready. Um, so it'll be very interesting, that's for sure. And the thing I find funny is so pro football um, focus ranked every roster in the NFL. Guess who's last? The Cardinals. The Arizona Cardinals. And yeah. like when you look at their roster, they split players up between three categories. Elite, good and average, and then basically below or above average and good, and then mm-hmm. just average players. And the only guy that they have above average, which is Patrick Pe- uh, Patrick Peterson. Everyone else is either below average or average, like on offense. Max Williams, Larry Fitzgerald, Christian Kirk are the only ones that they have at that lowest tier, or the third tier. The lowest yeah. would be not any of them. Uh, on defense, Terrell Suggs, who they added, um, Rodney Gun- Gunther, Chandler Jones, Jordan Hicks, and then DJ Swearinger are the only ones besides Patrick Peterson to be on that kind of three-level scale and it's just for the Cardinals, I feel like the one thing I'm seeing is a lot of people want to compare Kyler Murray to Baker Mayfield. Can he have the mm-hmm. same impact on the Cardinals? Not the same team. That, not even close. And I get it's not the same team, but people are saying, can you have the same Im- impact on the Cardinals yeah. that Baker had? And it's like what you said is true. Not the same team. That that Browns team. not even team, close to the same team. That Browns team had drafted well before Baker to add a guy like Miles Garrett, to mm-hmm. add a Jabril Peppers at the time, to have a guy like Jarvis Landry in that receiving court. And I know people are going to say, well, Ricky, they got Larry Fitzgerald. They drafted Christian Kirk. They've got the wide receivers. There. They've got David Johnson. To me, the big thing that it's going to come down to is can this offensive line be better than 32nd in pass blocking? And number two, moving over defensively, how big are the additions of Jordan Hicks and Terrell Suggs going to be with this defense to where is this defense going to get some extra turnovers, get some extra stops to give Kyler Murray more chances with the ball? Because that's how the Cardinals win games, in my mind, is basically it's like throwing crap at a wall and seeing what sticks. Mm -hmm. We're going to give Kyler Murray as many bullets as we can, basically as many possessions that we can, and see what he can do with them. And that's dangerous. It's dangerous in a lot of ways. Dangerous if you can't protect the man, keep him on his feet. Dangerous because he's a rookie, and rookie mis- rookies typically make mistakes. Mm-hmm. Um, even the good ones make mistakes. Uh, so it'll be rough. And before we get into the schedule, the one last thing I did want to say when it comes to mm-hmm. Kyler Murray, because you had mentioned it, um, with the whole the baseball football thing, so with the baseball side of things, the only thing he had to do was he's still got a contract with the A's mm-hmm. for this season that's going on um, right now, I believe. Yeah, for right now because he was drafted yeah. um, last year. He forfeited his four point four five um, million dollar bonus when mm-hmm. he decided to go to the NFL. Yeah. However, on the NFL side. This is a four-year contract with a possible fifth-year option. It is fully guaranteed. However, the deal will void if he leaves for the MLB. So yeah. I've said it before. I'll say it again. That was a great thing by the Cardinals. Definitely. Making sure that language is in there. That, but, hey, after year mm-hmm. one, if you leave, you don't get this fully guaranteed yeah. contract anymore. But at the same time, if things are not going well, he might not care. Mm-hmm. Which... I'm looking at it too, where it's like, hey, if, if I had 35 million all guaranteed, I don't care if I hate it. I'm sticking out that contract. That's 35 million fully guaranteed. Yeah. Like no. These athletes are different kinds of, of people. What you're though. getting. Let's look at the schedule though. Mm-hmm. What do you think of Arizona? They have a later buy, the week 12 buy. Um, when it comes to the AFC West, they're going to obviously play their division. They are going to play the NFC South. And they are going to play the, I'm looking for the AFC one, I think the AFC North, um, and then have the two common opponents of, for them, it's Detroit, mm-hmm. and I'm looking for that second one, I can't find it, Mark. 
Um, I think not Atlanta, New, New York, um, Detroit and New York, the Giants um, yeah. are the two um, uncommon division opponents. Yeah. What are your thoughts on the schedule? I hate so many things about this schedule for the <laughs> Arizona Cardinals. Uh, you know, and, second toughest defense week two. Yeah, but I mean, even starting off, you know, they might be able to get that win against Detroit, but that's a big question mark. That defense Detroit's, is tough. That defense yeah. is tough. They've got a better defense. They got Matthew Stafford mm-hmm. out there. They've got a lot. But Arizona might be able to get that one just purely for the fact of Kyler Murray is out there for his first game. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know you got you're going against the Ravens, then the Panthers, the Seahawks. Those are tough defenses. Mm-hmm. I don't really know what Cincinnati's going to be like, so we'll see. But they were good for a little while last year. Uh, Atlanta will be healthy. New York, that's probably a winnable game. You'll probably be okay. Uh, in that case. You're going to New Orleans. You know, you're playing your division, obviously. Tampa, eh, you'll be okay against Tampa. Uh, but it is Bruce Arians, so he mm-hmm. might be inspired when you come to his new turf. Um, <laughs> On Dave's birthday. Yeah, it's just I I could see the Arizona Cardinals. Please don't be too angry. I could see you guys as a two-win team next year. And it's... It's not necessarily a, a big mark on your on your team as much as this is just a really difficult schedule. Yeah, and I mean, when I look at it, this is a team that right now I don't know wins and losses, but I know for sure this is a team that's going to be top five, possibly top three draft pick next mm-hmm. year. And I know it's way too early, but when we look at it, the thing I'm really liking from early mock drafts is so right now I'm looking at Tankathon. If you want another right? quarterback, you can take well, one. Not not that. I'm looking at Tankathon, right? Mm-hmm. They've got the Dolphins at one, the Bengals at two, the Cardinals at three. Dolphins go at Tua. They have the Bengals then go at Jake Fromm, quarterback, quarterback. Hey, if I'm the Cardinals, if I get three, if I get four, if I get five— there's a possibility that Jerry Judy, the wide receiver from Alabama, could be there for them. And, like, if I'm a Cardinal fan, that's the guy I kind of pray does well, is up yeah, there. Yeah, we got to see the whole college season Because, next year. I mean, that is somebody adding in with Christian Kirk. You're hoping that Andy Isabella, although he was taken later, he was mm-hmm. a part of that um, Josh Rosen deal is how you got him, that he could be a nice addition to this team – You're hoping Kevin White can stay healthy, but you need... Not going to happen. You're going to need that marquee guy, and Jerry Mm -hmm. Judy could be that marquee guy for you when Laurie Fitzgerald hangs it up at the... I'm assuming he's going to hang it up at the end of the season. Who knows? Because, yes, offensive line is your weakest spot, but wide receivers, yes, NFL.com thinks that Christian Kirk is going to be a pro bowler this year, but really, besides Larry Fitzgerald and Christian Kirk... What are you putting your faith in Chad Williams, Andy Isabella, Kevin White, and Hakeem Butler? Like, yeah. I'm not. Yeah, patience is the key. Mm-hmm. It's not a one year turnaround. Mm-hmm. How many years do you think they give Cliff? Because I mean, I they, think they've they invested quite a bit in him, so I'm going to say three years. They almost what? Did they chud their last coach, or he got yeah. two years? Okay, he did. That was his. Mm-hmm. Only, I forget because I was calling him to be fired when he got hired, basically. Yeah. Um, so I forget how many. Well, it was just an. Uh, it's nothing against With against Wilkes. Wilkes. It's just the fact that it was an obvious kind of. This is all we've got. Mm-hmm. Higher, and it was also an obvious like they're going. Well, you knew that they were going to move on from him the first chance they got. Which Steve Wilkes uh, did not know. I maybe I knew this when we did the uh, previews, but uh, guess where he's the defensive coordinator now? Don't know the Cleveland Browns. Oh. Okay. So he's now the defensive coordinator over there. Yeah, he was only with Arizona um, for one season. But any final thoughts about the Cardinals before we move on into the 49ers? Protect your quarterback, please. Yeah, this is one where it's going to be interesting to see how Kyler Murray does, but I could see this team being, like Mark said, like at best a five-win team. Um, But that's like really shooting for the moon. Yeah, it's a lot better than I said. I see this team as like a top three, top five pick. In the NFL draft, maybe two, three wins. Five wins is like your ceiling, and you're like ecstatic that you got five wins because you're like, holy shit, we actually did something. Um, But let us know what you guys think down below in that comment section. And, Mark, let's move on into the next team. They finished third in the NFC West. That is the San Francisco 49ers. And if you're just tuning in here on YouTube, make sure 
to rate and review the Onside Kick on Apple Podcasts and iTunes. Every five-star rating means the world to us and helps us get into the ears of more people. I believe the Onside Kick, the last time I checked, I think Mm -hmm. we're a 4.5 out of 5. So there's no way that we can get that perfect rating like the Rick and Johnny podcast has, shameless plug. Yeah, we're at a 4.5 out of 5 with 19 ratings. The last one was from Twitchy. He said, really like it. Hell yeah. Five stars. You the man, Twitchy. So let's get into the 49ers like we do for each team. Go through their kind of rankings and offensive yards per game. They were 16th in the NFL, 360 yards. Points per game, they were just over 21, 21st in the league. Defensively, they gave up 346 yards per game, which was good for 13th in the league. But points per game, they gave up quite a bit. 27.2, which was good for 28th all time. That was the, let's say, if we're flipping it, that would be, what, one, two, three, four, what, the fifth most points given up by an NFL team. This is a team that will obviously be getting back Jimmy Garoppolo this year, but other things they did in free agency. They signed Kawan Alexander, linebacker, to a four-year deal. They bring in Tevin Coleman, reuniting with uh, Kyle Shanahan on a two-year deal. They trade for D. Ford, outside linebacker, from the Chiefs. Um, they place the franchise tag on Robbie Gold, but he hasn't signed with them yet. Um, they signed Jordan Matthews to a one-year deal. They bring in guys like um, Mossert to a three-year deal, running back Jason Verrett, Jimmy Ward, Mike Pearson, which is cornerback, defensive back, and offensive guard. And their biggest, to me, biggest draft picks were Nick Bosa on the defensive side, Debo Samuels, and possibly a Jalen Hurd on the offensive side with the wide receivers. But the first thing I want to get into Mm -hmm. Is the injuries and the 49ers have two big guys on offense coming back from injury. One is their quarterback, Jimmy Garoppolo. The other one I'll throw in there is Jarek McKinnon. Let's start with Garoppolo. What do we expect from Jimmy coming back from his injury mm-hmm. last year? Well, I don't really know why we're talking about Jimmy Garoppolo. They got a good quarterback. His name's Nick Mullins. That's the quarterback of the San Francisco <sighs> 49ers. I mean, Nick Mullins, that's their man. Really? Uh, that that that's, that's the guy. Do. That's the guy right there, Nick Mullins. I mean, did Jimmy Garoppolo throw for two thousand yards last season? No, he would have thrown I don't for think so. more. I don't think he did. Uh, anyways, with Jimmy, um, here's the thing: I have zero faith Jimmy Garoppolo will ever play a full season in the NFL. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a full on. I'll believe it when I see it, and even then, I'm going to ask you to prove it a second time. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's just all. Jimmy Garoppolo to me is the pure personification of the pretty boy syndrome. Syndrome. Mm-hmm. He is a quarterback who is a pretty boy who's shown us some good things. And when I say pretty boy, yes, he's a pretty man. Mm-hmm. But I also mean like he's a pretty quarterback. Yeah. He's got the arm strength. He's got a lot of those prototypical things you like. But he's never actually given you enough. Mm-hmm. He's only given you these small little samples that he is getting so much benefit of the doubt mm-hmm. from the NFL uh, to where it's just well, like he really hasn't actually deserved what he's kind of gotten. And a big thing is quarterbacks don't get as lucky as Jimmy Garoppolo do to basically play for like six games and get yourself a big contract for mm-hmm. even though you got injured in the process. Um, well, he got traded and then got a big contract. But play for the San Francisco 49ers, get hurt, and still – have them have so much faith in you. The San Francisco 49ers could have drafted a quarterback if they wanted. Mm-hmm. They were number two overall. I don't blame them for taking uh, Bosa instead. That was the correct choice. That's what they should have done. And I'm not saying they should have went out and gotten a quarterback. I do think Jimmy Garoppolo deserves a second chance here because why not? Your team's not good anyways. Um, you know, you're better than the Arizona Cardinals. Let's not get that mistaken here, but you were still not a very good team. Um Jimmy Garoppolo has gotten so much leash Mm -hmm. that a normal quarterback wouldn't get. And I I just think it's interesting. And I, and I, like I said, it's the pretty boy syndrome. He's a nice franchise quarterback who, you know, he shows you the beautiful arm. He's got those little bits of promise. I don't think it's, it's, it's not a pretty boy syndrome. It's a, I think it is. It's a potential 
is what we're looking mm. at is he's been sitting behind in New England, Tom Brady, for his entire sure. career. So have many quarterbacks that have failed in the place that they went to apparently next. Apparently supposed to Yeah, but you can't put that on like you can't put that on Jimmy. But yes, I'm just saying you can't yes, also it's a trend. But then you can't also use it in his benefit. Well, I'm looking at it as it hurt mm-hmm. him in a sense of like he had to sit behind Tom Brady. I'm not saying he learned anything from Tom. Mm-hmm. I'm saying he had to sit behind Tom Brady. So we didn't get to see his potential. Like there was a while before that season that yeah. Tom got suspended where people were asking is he even any good? Like, is Jimmy Garoppolo yeah. good? What do we expect from Jimmy Garoppolo? Because we never seen him play. It was always, mm-hmm. he's going to be the heir apparent when Tom retires. Then the whole thing happened with the article that came out from ESPN, Sean saying it's bullshit. Yeah. I don't think it was bullshit um, because there's some truth to it now that mm-hmm. Jimmy gets traded. Um, who was the one that pulled the pin on that? Basically, Robert Kraft. Mm-hmm. He's the owner. If someone, if he wants someone traded, they're going to get traded. And then with the 49ers, gets injured this year, well, last year, which should have been his big year with San Francisco. Of course, the year before, they're like, hey, we're, we trade for you. We're just going to shut it down. No reason to get you injured yeah. um, after trading for you in that season. I just... But with, I still say with even... With even if it, um, the Patriots, and, mm-hmm. and I've made this point many times, uh, so I don't need to labor on it too much, but he goes out there, he looks really good with the Patriots. Mm-hmm. Everyone's like, wow, he is the real deal. He gets hurt. And you know who also looked really good? Brissette. Brissette. He looked really, really good as well. And to me, that says, once again, it doesn't matter who the quarterback is. Mm-hmm. Bill Belichick's system is amazing. Yeah, but I also think that Kyle Shanahan's system is it good is. for him. Well, cause I mean, Nick Mullins, on, I joked about it, but Nick Mullins actually did look good. Well, And that's the thing of, like, Kyle Shanahan is a system that mm-hmm. if you fit in that system, you can do well. Look at Matt Ryan. Yeah. And the one thing I just have to double check is if, uh, let's see, yeah, so it's 2017, Mm-hmm. Jimmy's first year in well, San Francisco was his first year. You look at those six games, a good completion percentage of mm-hmm. just above 67%. In those six games, had just over 1,500 yards. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to do basic math, and, and a, I know that you can't do this, but I'm just going to go right. off of the I'm average here. Do I'll round down to 1,500. So we have 1,500 divided by six times a full 16. That's a four thousand. That's a four thousand yard season mm-hmm. potentially for Jimmy. He was Garoppolo. on pace for a four thousand yard season. exactly, and he had seven mm-hmm. touchdowns to five interceptions. And pretty much the only thing for me that was concerning: five interceptions, eight sacks, and yeah. that's the only things. So the three games that he had, the Minnesota game wasn't his best game. Mm-hmm. The other two games against Detroit. And KC were a lot better. It's almost like you were saying when he plays a good defense, he doesn't do well. It was also that first week. I feel mm-hmm. like the first week, Jerick McKinnon was – or no, he got injured in the preseason. But it was like mm-hmm. George Kittle was also – like there was that new tight end situation there. And with Jimmy Garoppolo, I just feel, yes, he's gotten injured twice now because he got injured um, and why Brissett came in when Brady was suspended – the question is, it's not whether Garoppolo is going to be good, because I feel like if he's healthy, he is the franchise quarterback for the 49ers. The question is, and you kind of alluded to it, but this mm-hmm. is more of what I think it is, is he going to be healthy? Is the injury in New England, the injury last year, is that signs of things to come when you're injured, you get injured again, and then it keeps happening over and over and over? Yeah. Or was it just a freak thing and we don't have to worry about injuries with Jimmy and Garoppolo? And to be fair, we criticize uh, that Kyler Murray hasn't faced real NFL defenses. Mm-hmm. Eastern Illinois doesn't play real NFL defenses. Yeah, but he's so far out of the league that— But he, we said it ourselves, he didn't get to play. He didn't get to play very much. I mean, looking at the teams, and I'm only I'm mm. going to go through his whole games per play. But my point per. is when he's played real defenses, mm-hmm. when he's been a quarterback well, who plays, he gets hurt. Let's look at it. His rookie year, the only game I'm going to use is he threw 17 passes mm-hmm. against Buffalo. They lost 17-9. to nine. Yep. Um, 2015, 
He didn't really play at all. Nope. He threw four passes that entire year, so that's a wash. Um, 2016, two games he played. Miami, they won 31-24. Mm-hmm. The Cardinals, they won 23-21. to But that was not last year's Cardinals two years ago. Um, and those Arizona to Cardinals. The, basically the end of the uh, Yeah, and those Arian were early, saga. early in the year. That was uh, September mm-hmm. 11th and September 18th. And what happens in, in that one? Got hurt when he played a good defense. Mm-hmm. And then we look at 2017. He, against Chicago, 15-14. to 14, um, played really well in that game, although he didn't have any touchdowns. But then also beat Houston, beat Tennessee, beat Jacksonville, and beat the um, Los Angeles Rams. And those were all with the 49ers. So he came over, beat the Bears, beat the Texans, the Titans, the Jaguars, um, and the Rams. And the lowest completion percentage he had were 60% against the Texans, and the Rams, respectively, both of those were road games. Um, teams like the Bears, Titans, and Jags, he had 70% or above completion. I just look at it and I go, not every single bad defense he's played, he's mm-hmm. done bad. Yes, some of them have been... Good defense, I wor- think you mean. Good defense. Yeah. have been worse games than others. But I think the bigger question is his health. It's not... Can he be successful? Mm -hmm. It's can he be out on the field to be successful? Well, I mean, I and I don't want to harp on this too much, Mm. but I think when he's played almost every single good defense he's played, he's almost had a very completely even touchdown to interception ratio. I think that's that's a really scary stat. You got to keep the interception numbers down. I and you know, in his best season, he nearly had an even touchdown interception ratio. Mm-hmm. And he's not on it's not like he's got amazing weapons to throw the ball to. So you gotta give him some yeah. some leeway on that one. Well and but still that's why I lean into the other guy that was injured, mm-hmm. Jerick McKinnon. Now with Tevin Coleman coming in, mm-hmm. do you expect McKinnon to be the main back, Coleman to be the backup kind of I'm like, gonna say probably committee. Okay. Pretty even split. Like um, between Jer- their options. Because Jerick McKinnon was set up to potentially have a really good year last year. Mm-hmm. And then the knee injury, I think it was an ACL, derailed them. They also yeah. got um, Matt Britta, mm-hmm. who also had a solid year last year. So, I mean, I could see them going with committee, but it's like with Tevin Coleman coming in, yeah. what does that kind of fit with? And I think that mm-hmm. McKinnon is obviously the main back. Is just how much of Britta and Coleman and what situations are we going to see? I don't even in? know if I think that McKinnon is the number one back here. I, I'm mm-hmm. leaning more towards a pure split just to keep things Fresh. safe. Yeah, keep it safe, keep it even. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, the thing I love about the San Francisco 49ers here in this offseason is they did a lot to try and make this team better. Mm-hmm. You know, they're doing everything they can. Part of it's easy when you're number one or number two, but basically number one pick because of Kyler. Uh, and you can get Nick Bosa. That's huge. When you go get Debo Samuel, who should be an awesome wide receiving weapon for you. You got Jordan Matthews on this team now, which should be a pretty good weapon as well. Mm-hmm. You're going out and getting a lot of additional pieces to your puzzle here. Um, you know, Richard Sherman's still there, and I know Richard Sherman wasn't amazing necessarily last year, but the whole team wasn't great last year. He's a good leader, though, on that defense. Yeah, you, you've got a lot of the pieces here. The you thing, should be able to get something done. The thing I want to throw out, though, about um, Jordan Matthews is, for mm-hmm. me, has not been a, I'm going to say, I know he only, eh, I know he only played in 14 games last year, 10 games in um, 2017. Yeah. My question is, what Jordan Matthews are we going to see with the 49ers? Are we going to see Very the Jordan question. Matthews that we saw with Buffalo and Philly in 17-18? Or can I see the Jordan Matthews that I saw his first run in Philly mm-hmm. in that 2016 year, 2015-14, where he was an 18 or an 800 and above yard receiver per game? Am I going to see that guy, or am I going to see the one that I saw the last two years where it's like, well, you know. He's okay. He's okay. He's a 300-yard guy. Yeah, and I mean, I don't know what their expectation out of him is. With You know, they go and get Debo. They go Mm -hmm. ahead and get Jalen Hurd. They've got George Kittle, who seems to be such a valuable piece to this puzzle. Mm -hmm. Um, So they might not have a huge expectation for him to be a 800-yard receiver. They might say 500 is good enough. 
we're all right with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, I think they're going to want more and more and more from anybody because why not? But yeah, I don't think that there's the huge expectation for him there. I also like defen- defensively, they've made moves. I mentioned Alexander. He's going to play the Mike linebacker position. Mm-hmm. D Ford in a trade. He's going to probably be on the defensive line on the outside. Now they have Nick Bosa also. They're hoping for the Bosa D Ford um, defensive end bookmarks or bookends on the side. You got Buckner out there as well. That's it's a scary line. You've got Richard Sherman in that backfield, like we said, older, but still to me a quality cornerback and a quality leader on that defense. I mm-hmm. wonder how much of this, like if the pieces fall in place. I think the 49ers could be a team, and I know people are going to say, well, Ricky, you were high on the 49ers sure last were. year. You had them 10 wins and above. They were number two overall. But the 49ers could be a team, I think, that people sneak the, like they sneak their way into people's expectations, where it's like a team that was bad the year before, but then is – a nine ten win team, you're like, holy shit! I forgot, I forgot about the Niners. Like the Niners are doing really good. Like that's what they could be. Where you kind mm-hmm. of almost forget about them because of the season they had last year. That they may surprise people yeah. when they're in a playoff race this year. And here's the thing: if we can move into the schedule a little bit, because they, they've got some, they've Goes got some things hand. going well with them. Mm-hmm. They can start on an absolute roll. Jimmy Garoppolo will be there. He'll be healthy. Yes, you got back to back away games mm-hmm. to start. But it's against Tampa Bay. Manageable, Cincy. manageable opponents. You can be I okay. I even say week three is a manageable well, opponent. Well, you're gonna if you had the momentum rolling in mm-hmm. here against Pittsburgh. I hate the bye week. Week four bye is always terrible. Mm-hmm. It's like the season hasn't even started yet, and you already got a bye. Yeah. Uh, but then it gets a little bit tough with Cleveland and L.A. Uh, but Washington and Carolina. I don't think you're that far off from a Carolina team. Then with Arizona, like it's just these streaks. This team can go on these little runs Mm -hmm. that can carry them to a pretty decent season. Unfortunately, the end of the season kind of terrifies me. Uh, Green Bay, Baltimore, New Orleans, Atlanta, Rams, Seattle, at Mm -hmm. Seattle. So I feel like this is a team that will have some hope, and they'll be right in there at like midseason. People are like, yeah, you know what? These San Francisco 49ers, they can make a run in the playoffs, I think. They might be able to do it. And then they're going to hit this brick wall. Of all these really good teams, and I think that's going to kind of put them... And I'm not saying they're a bad team. Mm-hmm. I'm saying that's going to put them in the not-yet category. You're almost there, assuming Jimmy Garoppolo is healthy. You're almost there, but just not yet. This isn't your well, year. Here's the thing I look at. and the Week 12 through 17, I agree. I look at that and go, Ugh. But the thing is, what can they do in those first 11 games? And mm-hmm. when I look at it... This is a team, you say that you go uh, against Cleveland, I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Until Cle- like, originally when the OB... You can't say until Cleveland well, proves itself and was, then say that San Francisco 49ers are good to go. Oh, no, no. I'm saying okay, that good. in that one, mm-hmm. I can see the Browns winning it, but coming off the bye week in San Francisco, Monday night football... I'd give the edge to the 49ers in that one. And when it comes to the Browns, I know after the OBJ trade, everyone wants to be like, crown them. But let's simmer expectations. Like, I, I'll let people in. After the OBJ trade, I was like, you know what, guys? I'm going to do it. I'm going to make the Browns my Super Bowl champions just to give them the kiss of death with all the hype. I have simmered down from that, mm-hmm. of, like, recently. Like, oh, you know what? Let's simmer down now. Let's think of this realistically. I don't think that's an opponent that comes into the 49ers and the 49ers are like, man, we should be scared of this team. It's more of an even matchup in my mind. Now, the next one against the Rams is a different story. I see the first 11 games. The only... Mm, I see a potentially, at worst, five, one, two, three, four losses. Mm-hmm. Steelers, Rams, Panthers, Seahawks. But in those games, let's say they win three of them, there are two losses going into week week twelve. That would be what eight and two going in. Okay, now things are different. I'm not expecting to lose every game from twelve to seventeen. I'm expecting that. But if I go like mm-hmm. if they go eight and two in those first ten, then they can like at worst, hey, we went two and four to end the season. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't matter. We're still ten and six. 
sets up sets us up very nicely for the playoffs. Or let's say they get lucky and they're only a one loss team heading into that. That just gives them more cushion heading into that away game at the Saints. Heading into that away game against Baltimore, the away game against Cincinnati. Because when it comes to the division, if Jimmy Garoppolo is healthy, if Jerick McKinnon's healthy, mm-hmm. Cardinals don't win like they did last year. The Rams could potentially be a split in my mind, but I could lean with the Rams winning Depends both of on them. That Super Bowl hangover. And I think Seattle is definitely a split if everything rolls the right way for the 49ers. I, I just can't see the San Francisco 49ers right now, mm-hmm. with what I know, which is that Jimmy Garoppolo is an injury-prone quarterback, but I'm giving, giving the benefit of the doubt that he's going to be healthy. Mm-hmm. Um, I still don't see them as better than a 7-9 and nine team. And that's with a healthy Jimmy Garoppolo. Because week 12 through 17, they're playing all playoff caliber teams. So let me ask you this. Mm-hmm. Just week 12 to 17. Yes. How many wins and losses do you have in that? Zero wins, all losses. So that means heading into that, mm-hmm. you're going to have, what, that's six games. They're going to be, what, a seven and three? Eh. Yeah. Okay. That that works out. So seven yeah. and three heading into losses probably against L.A., Carolina, and then it's a toss-up for me between, like, maybe that first Seattle mm-hmm. game, maybe that Pittsburgh game. Yeah. I mean, I could see that because those were the ones mm-hmm. that I saw. I just – I don't think – it's a possibility week 12 to 17 they go 0 and 6. I just think at worst they get two of those and that's only because the Packers and the the Falcons. Those are the two mm-hmm. that I look at of like they can win. Like Jimmy Garoppolo against Aaron Rodgers. But remember, Aaron Rodgers hates the 49ers. I get that. But both of them being He at loves ho- to beat them. Both of them being at home, I feel like plays into a positive for the 49ers although i could see zero and six but really i atlanta's see my biggest question mark thereof dude they could be a good team they be. could be a bad team they were mm-hmm. riddled with injuries and last just, year as much as a, as a, the bears fan in me wants to uh mm-hmm. rain on the green bay packers parade i know better than to ever count them out yeah i just they're a team that i am gonna be iffy this year because of the matt lafleur hire how's that gonna mesh with Aaron Rodgers this year. Um, but any final thoughts on this team? Anything we didn't touch with the 49ers? Um, Kittle. He's, I mean, he, Gr- uh, Gronk is, he gonna is have, gone. Is he going to have as good of a year? I mean, Gronk was with the Patriots. But, but I no, mean, I'm saying Gronk is gone. So oh. he's he's the heir apparent to number one wide res- or, uh, tight end, right? I'll ask you this question, and this is kind of a fantasy question. Especially with a, you know, a good quarterback out there. If you are drafting for your fantasy team, Mm-hmm. Obviously, number one pick will probably be Travis Kelsey. Zach Ertz will probably be um, number two. Is George Kittle the for sure third guy? And is there a possibility you're taking him over a Kelsey or a Ertz? I think that people will. The hard thing is just you don't know if the quarterback's going to be there. If mm-hmm. he's got a Jimmy Garoppolo. I mean, he was good last year with Mullins. Yeah, but that's my thing. If he's got a Jimmy Garoppolo. <laughs> then he's really good. Do you, can you, like, you can imagine him being like Travis Kelsey with Patrick Mahomes. Yeah. The other thing that's going to be the big question mark are two two couple of guys, uh, Hawkinson and Noah Fant. Mm-hmm. You know, where they're going to fall in there. Because people are going to have, especially Hawkinson, I think, people are going to have a really high fantasy expectations for mm-hmm. this year. Yeah, I mean, if Garoppolo's healthy, I mean, George Kittle's stock, I think, can mm-hmm. skyrocket because um, he can't. He blew the doors off for me. I know Dave yeah. was all like, "That's my boy, that's my boy, uh, George Kittle," but it's like, come on, Dave, you didn't know he was going to be like or that before the if year. If you don't believe in Jimmy Garoppolo, get Kittle, have him for a couple weeks, mm-hmm. try and trade bait him. Hey, you could do that as well. But let us know what you guys think down below in that comment section. What should we expect from the 49ers this year? Will Jimmy Garoppolo stay healthy? Anything we talked about in this segment. And, Mark, let's move on into the Seattle Seahawks. Before we do, make sure you check us out on Twitch, twitch.tv backslash Podcast. Live podcast is something that we're going to do in the future. And also, if you've got that Amazon Prime free sub for Twitch, Throw it our way. It's like I'm saying, Kurt Schilling, why not us? Why not give that free sub over to us and join the family? We got just another one, Mark, um, yesterday when Dave and I were live for free agency. So now we're, what, to four or five subs 
for twitch.tv backslash most of our podcast that you can follow and sub to brand today. new so you can be one of the first it's brand new you can't be the first but one of the first you definitely can but let's move on the seahawks offensively they were last year 18th in yards per game 353 they were sixth in points per game putting up almost 27 points per contest Defensively, though, taking a little bit of a slide back than what we're used to. They were 16th in defensive yards per game, giving up 353 yards per contest, but 11th in points per game, giving up just over or just under 22 points. They were 21.7 on the year. This is a team defensively. I know we're going to look at them first, but free agency really quick. They added DJ Fluker, two-year contract. They got Mike Iupati on a one-year contract. Michael Kendricks, they re-sign him. They're bringing in, or they re-sign KJ Wright. They bring in Jason Myers, the kicker. The thing I want to look at first with the Seattle Seahawks team, because I know offensively we're going to look wide receivers, DK Metcalf, um, and what they can do. But defensively, this has been a unit that is not the Legion of Boom that we remember from years past. Is this still a defense that teams should be scared of when they play the Seattle Seahawks? To a degree, yes. You should still be scared of the Seattle Seahawks defense. It's just not as scared as you used mm-hmm. to be. Um, and part of that, too, is half their games going to be in Seattle, which is a difficult place to play. That Very gets, loud. Yeah, it gets loud. It's hard to... To get your offense going, so that still works it's, out. It's the second loudest behind uh, Arrowhead, right? The Chiefs Stadium is the loudest I think so. by Seattle. I think so, but if we're wrong, we'll hear it in okay. the comment section. Um, because Seattle fans, they take that loudness very seriously. Um, the 12th man. But, you know, uh, and, and the thing is, like, they've still got really good players defensively. You know, um, you got Barctavius Mingo, Ziggy Ansah, Shaquem Griffin, Bobby Wagner. You know, you've got some really good pieces here. Um, it's just that it's not the same. It's not mm-hmm. exactly what it was before. And they're kind of trying to rebuild it. And I think that's really interesting because this is the chance of, you know, we all talked about Pete Carroll coming in here out of college and just knocking these drafts out. Like the CLC Hawks had amazing drafts classes back to back to back to back Mm -hmm. and now it's those guys a lot of them are gone yeah let's see if you can do it again you have to really hit again now and that's when you see things like uh you know dk metcalf which i think has huge question marks to him um and you're like "Mm, i'm not sure if you've got it again i don't know if you can repeat the success you had before but especially they were good in later rounds too so Mm -hmm. that that was something they were good at so we'll see how that goes um, but yeah, the defense is not quite the same, but you should still be scared. The thing I was looking up is, so apparently there's the first website I looked at, um, which is our arc um, has a ranking of the 10 loudest stadiums in the NFL. Uh-huh. They have Seattle at one and then the chiefs at two. However, in an article posted earlier this year, January of 2019, um, SI says, according to the Guinness Book of World Records, no sports fans in the world are louder than the Chiefs at Arrowhead. Chief fans registered a record 142.2 decibels um, on September 29th, 2014. The Seattle Seahawks were previously recorded to be the NFL's lauded crowd noise at 137.6 decibels. It depends how good your team is, you know? So, I mean, right now the Chiefs hold that record. Um, the Seahawks are in second. But, yeah, this is a this is a team this year where it's not like a, oh, this defense sucks, they're not going to do anything. I just think it's one of those where you look at the Seahawks and go, okay, this is no longer a team that leans on that defense. This is now a team that's probably going to lean on that offense and lean not just on the offense – they're going to lean on Russell Wilson. Like, that is mm. the guy they are going to lean with. Because you look yeah. at the last few years with the guys that, A, they've lost, but they come into last year 10 and 6, they make the playoffs. The year before that, though, they were a 9 and 7 team, missed the playoffs. Mm-hmm. Then you've got 2016, they were 10, 5, and 1. 
Um, and then 2015, I think that was a um, the one of the last Super Bowl years. No, that was just after that. They were 10 and six. So they've been yeah. a nine and seven, 10 and six kind of floaty team. Mm-hmm. The question is for this year, is it going to be more on that low side or that high side? Or could this be the first year they fall below that nine and seven? And that's where I bring up the wide receivers because yeah. right now on the depth chart, you've got Tyler Lockett. And DJ Metcalf. DK. Uh, or DK Metcalf. I keep saying DJ. Um, DK Metcalf are the top two wide receivers. Yes, they have Jaron Brown. Yes, they have David Moore. But DK You're Metcalf saying and yes, Tyler Lockett. But we're like, oh no. Exactly. They have. Like, eh. mm-hmm. Is that a worrisome if you're a Seattle yeah. Seahawks? Oh, fan? totally. 100%. But at the same time. They also got Nick Vanett, too. Who yeah. Tight end, but receiver. But when has the. Um, I almost said Washington Redskins. When has the Seattle Seahawks mm-hmm. ever really had that great of an offensive, uh, like offensive weapons to throw the ball to? They've got they've had reliable, like Doug Baldwin They're, is reliable. Yes, reliable, mm-hmm. but they've never had great ones. Mm-hmm. So they don't need Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf to be great. And I will say that was a shocking piece of news when Doug Baldwin was like, "Fuck it, I'm going to retire." Mm-hmm. Yeah, fuck it, I'm done. Like I was like, "Holy shit." That's a big loss to them because they kind of had to scramble to fill that piece. But do they have that reliable guy? Like Tyler Lockett wasn't the number one. That was Doug Baldwin. Yeah. They had like Doug Baldwin, Jermaine Curse, Tyler Lockett. These weren't guys that were like Doug Baldwin was mm-hmm. their number one, but it, he was really just a solid guy that yeah. they had there. And I don't think they have that. Golden they don't have Tate it now. Years ago. Um, and. They've got serviceable guys for mm-hmm. sure, but they've ne- Russell Wilson's never really enjoyed that. Mm-hmm. Um, I just want to take a, a moment aside to appreciate. I thought you were going to say a moment of silence. No, to well, I mean, I think that might be worthwhile too. Mm-hmm. Uh, to appreciate this quarterback depth chart, you got <laughs> Russell Wilson. Mm-hmm. Then you've got Paxton Lynch, that first round pick that never got to play. Yep, and then. Gino, punch me in the face, Smith out there. Punch me like, in the face, Smith. This is such a great quarterback room mm-hmm. right there. You know, like, I don't really understand why these guys are there, why either of them have a job they needed in the to, NFL. They needed to fill a depth chart. Yeah, and it's like you really couldn't have found anybody better than these two guys. Hey, if anyone's going to make them better, Pete Carroll can do it, man. No, neither one of these guys are going to be made better. They're both really fucking bad. Well, maybe Russell Wilson will do – and when I say this, I'm going to preface it by I am a Roman Catholic, Mm -hmm. so I do believe in the same stuff that Russell Wilson says. But maybe he's going to pray really hard and then, you know, Paxton and Gino will just get better because the the will of God will make them better. Maybe if they drink more water. I say that as a Roman Catholic myself. So before someone says Ricky's bashing God – I'm throwing stones from my stone house. They need my to just house. drink more water, <laughs> put the phones away when they're in the bedroom, follow the TB12 <laughs> method. It'll all work out all right. But Don't I, have sex till you're married. Yeah, no, that, no, that, that's that one's Russell, Russell Wilson. Russell Wilson. Yeah, that one probably was not Tom Brady. Um, <laughs> Tom's doing the opposite. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, Tom's love life is an interesting one. Uh, that's for sure. Um, but anyways, uh, before people get mad that we're talking too much about Tom Brady in a Seahawks uh, video, uh, I just, this offense to me, they sit there as that, like, they're just, like, they are a good offense, mm-hmm. but they're not, they don't have what they need to be a great offense. And I think they went for DK Metcalf because he's got some of that physical freak parts to it. But as I said a bunch of times, the guy's got terrible route running ability. Mm-hmm. I mean, his combine, he had one thing that was really good. Or two, actually. Like, two things that were really good, and then everything else that was terrible. Mm-hmm. Like, he is such a big red flag to me. He's going to sit there and be one of these guys like a Laquan Treadwell or something like that where it was like, uh, hey, why haven't we seen Laquan play? Well, he's not good. He's mm-hmm. not ready. And I feel like that's going to be DK Metcalf. He's not going to be good enough. He's not going to be ready. Oh, he's going to play. Oh, he's going to play, he's but he's gonna not going to do anything worthwhile for your team. I think if anything, like, I hope he does something because mm-hmm. I'm pulling for him because he's one of my favorite prospects from this past draft. But 
I feel like he he has the potential mm-hmm. to be something in this team because there's basically no trees that are going to cut. Like, if he's a little plant that's starting to grow, there's no shade that's going to cover him. There's mm-hmm. no guys that are like, hey, push you down. You ain't going to come up. You know who's going to cover him? Easily whoever is on him. Oh, no. Without I, any problems when, when at all. When I say the shade thing, I mean, separation. like, there's no guys on the depth chart no, I know what you're saying. Climb up you there. used the word coverage, and it yeah. was perfect. <laughs> but, yeah, he can't get separation. He can't run routes. But like, He's an- not good at it. Another question I have about the offense, though, is the running back situation mm-hmm. also. Because it's like, yes, they've got three. Maybe that's why Paxton Lynch is there. They've got three good names of Chris Carson, Rashad Penny, and C.J. Procise, but it's... What are we going to, like, I know Carson was an 1,000-yard rusher yeah. last year, and Seahawks fans are going to say, what are you questioning that for? Carson was an 1,000-yard rusher. But without that pass game, mm-hmm. Lockett, yes, was a 900-yard receiver. Is DK Metcalf going to fill in for the other 600 that Doug Baldwin had? Are we going to see another 1,000-yard season out of Chris Carson? Because if you look back at his other years, and this is, only year, last year was year two, this is year three, he jumped from, I know it was only four games, but he jumped from 200 yards in 2017 to 1,100 yards in 2018. Are we going to see that again? Mm-hmm. Or are we going to see Rashad, per- or Rashad Perry get more, or Penny get more carries? Because now Mike Davis isn't there. He's over being run DMC in Chicago to where... I feel like the offense, wide receivers, the biggest question, can we get the same production out of the running backs? They're mm-hmm. going to be the strongest unit, though, when we're looking at the debate offense or defense yeah. for the Seahawks. And the thing to remember about the run game is they. this is a team that is a little traditional. They run the football. Mm-hmm. These unless, running backs will have Unless you're in the Super Bowl on the goal line. And it's third down. And it's third down, and you got one play to win the game. Then they don't. Yeah. They pass it. Throw the football because you got another down to to run the football yeah. next. Unless you throw an interception. Hmm. In that Should case, have thought about that. You don't get the chance. Should have thought about that. Uh, <laughs> and they're going to get their yards. Mm-hmm. These, these running backs will. They're good running backs. There's multiple good running backs. They'll be fine. My thing is just Russell Wilson. Russell Wilson can make... Average wide receivers and a good wide receivers. Mm-hmm. But when you only give him average wide receivers, yeah. he doesn't have much to work with. You know, he's not going to be the guy taking, you know, an average guy making him amazing, making mm-hmm. him great. So I, I, I wish that they would just give Russell Wilson a top quality wide receiver. And part of me is like, well, I think they think that they have that in DK Metcalf. Um, but to which I would say, I think you need to fire your scouts. Because everybody else looks at that combine, and I know you you said he's one of your favorite, but you like mm-hmm. the pure freak athlete I part do. of it. You don't necessarily like you're kind of ignoring the yeah, but the things that matter to a wide receiver, he mm-hmm. did bad at. But I mean, the thing I will say about him getting him where they did, you can take that risk. Like thirty second pick in the second round. I can take that risk on that guy to where mm-hmm. if probably they probably could have gotten a better wide receiver though. If they took him in the first round though, then it'd be like, uh, okay, that's a little bit of like I know mm-hmm. all of us had him in the first round, so it's not like, hey, Ricky, why are you saying that when you had him in the first round? But I feel like having him second round, there's more of that upside for hey, if he booms, he booms. If he busts, it would be way worse if he was a first round pick and he busted compared to end of the second round, almost early third round. Yeah, sucks no matter what. But What about the schedule? This is a team that, unlike what you had with the 49ers that you didn't like, they got a late bye. They've got a week 11 bye, so 10 games before yeah. it and then six games after it. Nice spot. You know, I, I kind of like the Seahawks schedule for the Seahawks. You know, uh, get to start off against Cincinnati. You know, mm-hmm. you know, maybe an easier win. Yeah, you're going to Pittsburgh, but Pittsburgh's a question mark. Could be a manageable one. You get a couple of these games that you can get some momentum with before mm-hmm. you have New Orleans come to you. Yeah, they, That's huge. They could be, to me, like, in the first six games, they could be four and two, with the two games being the question of New Orleans and L.A. But the good thing about those, they're both coming to Seattle. Exactly. Which... 
Speaking of that, I'm going to scratch that and make it a 5-1 and one, because I think Rams and Seahawks could split. And if they split, I'm going to give the Seahawks the win at home, obviously. Mm-hmm. They've got kind of some some easier ones. The middle of the schedule, like, yeah, they've got L.A., Cleveland, Baltimore, Atlanta, uh, which can have some trouble parts mm-hmm. to it. But then they get to play Tampa and San Francisco. That one's at San Francisco, so yeah. maybe on that one. But going into the bye before having to go play Philadelphia, who mm-hmm. there's question marks about Philly, too. you know. And then they end their season with Arizona and San Francisco. I see the... The Seahawks basically right where they were last year. Mm-hmm. That ten and six, maybe a nine and seven range, probably right in that wild card spot for a playoff. You know, um, if if LA has a big Super Bowl hangover, Seattle Seahawks might win their division this year. Let's see. I'm counting losses really quick. So one, two, three, four. Mm, yeah, this is a team where I look at it and I feel like they're going to be right back to where they were the last two years. Where mm-hmm. at best they're 11 and 5, but realistically, I think 10 and 6 is what we're looking at because I think the Saint, like Saints and uh, half of the LA, like the LA game doesn't matter because I think LA will split with Seattle, but the New Orleans game is interesting because it's in Seattle. Um, Baltimore is going to be tough, but it's in Seattle. Minnesota is going to be tough, but it's in Seattle. You have those things going right for you. But I look at New Orleans, Baltimore, Minnesota, a Philly, one against the 49ers, one against the Rams. There's a possibility for like a six loss schedule here. The only question is, are you going to be surprised? Is Cleveland going to surprise you at the dog pound? Is Atlanta going to surprise you in the Mercedes-Benz Dome Stadium? I think it's the stadium. Sounds right. Um, The new stadium that they built. Is a team like Carolina going to surprise you yet again on the road? Those are the questions that I think is asked. Typically, the Seahawks don't do great on the road. Usually I have a bigger window for these teams, but this one I've got a razor thin window of mm-hmm. probably ten and six, nine and seven. But we've seen the last two years. They're either gonna be nine and seven and miss the playoffs or ten and six, just like they were last year, second place in the division, right behind the Rams, and going to the playoffs as a wild card team, or depending on how tough this conference is. Could miss the playoffs at ten and six, but I would go with if they're ten and six, they're a wild card team. Yeah, I'm leaning towards them as a wild card again this year, um, but you never know. I mean, if a team like the Vikings get in there where they didn't last year, Packers come back, mm-hmm. things can change. The 49ers healthy, what do mm-hmm. they look like this year? Um, it's going to be an interesting one. But Seattle fans, let us know what you guys think down below in that comment section. What did we miss about your team? What were we right? What were we wrong on? What do you think about your Seahawks in 2019? But, Mark, let's move into the last team in the division, and that is the Los Angeles Rams, the NFC champions, Yeah, but not Super Bowl champions. They scored how many points in the Super Bowl, Mark? Three. Three points. One, two, three. That offense that was second in yards per game last year, 421 yards per game, and second in points per game, 23.9, almost 33 points per game. Only scored three. Only scored three. And counted on one Bowl. hand. The defense last year, 19th overall in yards per game, 358 was around what they were giving up last year. Points per game, they were 20th, gave up about 24. Didn't matter, though. The offense was scoring all the points for the Rams. Before we get into the Rams, make sure to check us out on patreon.com backslash most vile podcast. Shout out to Charlie, our newest patron, joined us at the bronze level, gets Discord access, gets the MVP podcast a month early. You could join Charlie too at the bronze, silver, or gold level. Check it out in the description. But Mark, let's talk about these Rams free agency this year. They matched an offer by the Lions two year, 3.25 um, offer sheet. Um, for Malcolm Brown, so he's going to be back on the team. Running back Blake Bortles signed to a one-year deal. 
Clay Matthews on a two-year deal. Dante Fowler on a one-year deal. Eric Weddle on a two-year deal. A lot of defense, defense, defense for this team. I want to ask you this, though, with the Rams. Is this a team that is locked and loaded to go back to the Super Bowl this year? Or will last year, will we be looking at it like, man, last year was their shot. Last year was their shot to win it because will this year be the year where they play a Saints in the playoffs and it doesn't end up roses like it did last year? Well, it's funny, too, because you look at last year and the teams they lost to in the regular season, the Saints, Mm -hmm. the Bears, the Eagles. They lost to playoff teams, you know, and there was other playoff teams, uh, you know, that they they beat. Obviously, they beat Seattle. They beat Kansas City. Mm -hmm. But still, I think it's interesting. They they did lose to some of those NFC playoff teams. And they get them again this year. They get the Saints and the Bears again this year. And... You know, there is some value to the Super Bowl hangover. You know, oftentimes mm-hmm. teams do kind of have a little bit of a harder time that next year, especially when it's a big one. You yeah. know, only scoring three points, losing in pretty spectacular fashion, actually pretty mundane. Embarrassing fashion. I was going to say mundane. It was very boring yeah. Super Bowl. Uh, probably the most boring Super Bowl most of us have watched in, it re- was in so recent memory. It was so boring that when people go, what was the score last year's Super Bowl? I go... Oh, what was the score last year's Super Bowl? Did we even have a Super Bowl last year? That's what my mind goes to. Yeah. I mean, the NFL figured, like, yeah, Maroon 5, uh, they'll be kind of a boring halftime performance, but mm-hmm. at least Patriots and Rams, that'll be an explosive Super Bowl. It'll yeah. be great. Uh, and no, no, just, just boring in general. That's all we got. Um, so when it comes to this, We like to make fun of the Rams. We like to tease the Rams because it was such an embarrassment. Like we like to tease uh, Peyton Manning when the football flew over his head and they got a safety to start off the Super Bowl. Um, We like to make fun of these things. But unless that Super Bowl hangover really messes with this team and McVay has just not had a full night's rest ever since the Super Bowl, and Jared Goff is falling apart, crying every night. McVay's a guy that barely got any sleep before the Super Bowl. I don't expect that this is a team that is going to fall off that hard. I do fully think that they will be a... We're ready for round two here. We're ready to prove ourselves and, and to shut up the doubters. I think the biggest questions here, in like, it's teams like this that A, could make boring previews because most people just go, yep, they're back to where they're going to be. Good night, everyone. See you guys next Um, week. But for me, there's two questions that are lingering with this team. Mm -hmm. Number one, Cooper Cup, injured last year. When's he going to officially return? What's his impact going to be this year? But even the more important one, what the hell went on with Todd Gurley? Todd Gurley to the end of the year – was basically like somebody from Space Jam took his powers Mm -hmm. and he couldn't play football anymore. I know he was on my fantasy team and basically fucked me the week. And I pardon me for the language, but fucked me the week that they played the Chiefs. I needed just a couple points, a couple points, Mark. Mm -hmm. How many did I get? Goose egg. Not that not that couple points that I needed. Yeah, you had a rough you had a rough year in fantasy. I had a last very year. rough year. Also that Texan game where all I needed was one kick from their kicker. One field goal. And I couldn't get it and I lost by one. Um it was not a good year for me. I did make the playoffs, so the, did I make the playoffs? I think I did. I think it was the fourth team. I, I'm gonna say it made the playoffs, so at least there was that. Um I did because I got my money back. Yeah, and that, but I feel like you made the playoffs, but you were like, eh. You didn't care. I made the playoffs. That was yeah. all that. I got my money back. That's all that mattered. Like, I tried to win that first game, but I knew I wasn't going to win that first game because I was going up against the number one. T- I was going up against Slowinski. No way I'm going to beat Mike Slowinski and how he was so powered or Lions guy. You yeah. may know him on the podcast, but going back to Todd Gurley, the question I will ask you, because I will eventually get to one, mm-hmm. are we going to see the Todd Gurley that we were used to or was last year... Things to come for Todd Gurley, and he's not going to be the same that we were used to from the Gurley monster. Yeah, I'm actually really unsure about Todd Gurley now. Uh, And I know that there was some injury concerns as well, but 
sometimes with these running backs, they do just disappear. Mm -hmm. You know, they do just fall off. And it's not like he had a terrible season last year. His season was fine. It just kind of sputtered and just, all right, that was the end of that. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it's still a 1,200-yard season. You know, you're still thrilled. I mean, his most touchdowns he's ever had did a really good job. It's just the problem was when you really needed him, he wasn't there for you. Mm -hmm. And like I said, injuries are a part of that, sure. But you really wanted more. And, you know, you don't expect someone to necessarily play through their injuries and just be just fine. And it's not like it wasn't. It's not like it was his decision to not be out there all the time when he wasn't out there. there was, that was Sean McVay. Exactly. But at the same time, you do just hope that those superstar players, those really key pieces to the franchise, somehow get it done mm-hmm. when you need it. Um, because, you know, Todd Gurley here, no one's going to say he's a bad running back. No mm-hmm. one's going to say he's not going to have a good year next year. But people will remember, imagine if they had him in the Super Bowl at full strength, you know, or playing as much as he could have. And according to The Athletic, um, here's what I've got from them about Cooper. I've got Cooper Cup and then Todd Gurley stuff. So with the Cooper Cup, this is what The Athletic says. By all accounts, Cup is on target to return for the Rams September 8th regular season opener against the Carolina Panthers in Charlotte. While he didn't get the green light to completely let loose during OTAs, Cup was available for some on-the-field work and even participated in 11-on-11 drills. Not not at full speed, mind you, but enough to show he appears on track to be ready week one. I'm taking it day by day, Cup said. It's just about attacking this week, attacking the day as best as I possibly can, and I feel good about where I'm at. So that's all we've got. Apparently he's ready to go or is planning to be ready to go for week one. Then I've got, and this is from Rambling Fan um, of the Fan Sided Network, that apparently when you look at this off season for the, um, St. or the, I almost said St. Louis, the LA Rams, Todd Gurley's knee is still a mystery. And that's the thing where it's like, we don't even know if it was a knee for sure. Mm -hmm. No one was really saying anything, but like, you look at it and go, is he still going to have a knee injury that's linging this year Yeah, and is going to affect his play? Yeah. And it's a big question mark. And it's going to be a question mark all the way to hopefully week one. Mm -hmm. I say hopefully and hopefully he answers it week one instead of a week two, three, four. Um, But, you know, he's a top fantasy running back. Of Mm -hmm. course it's going to come up. It's going to be a big talk throughout all the preseason. It's just not going to stop. Yeah. Because you know the L.A. Rams aren't going to play him in the preseason. Mm -hmm. They're going to let him sit. They're going to let him rest. Well, why would they? Exactly. They don't need to. They don't need to start any of these guys. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, it will be a lingering question. It'll be there for a long time, that's for sure. And, I mean, I also look at, let's see, um, one of the other big things is I know they bring back Malcolm Brown, who Malcolm Brown last year – had 43 carries, 212 yards. But when we went Mm -hmm. into the playoff run, it was C.J. Anderson that was one of the big pieces for this team no longer there. Can we expect Malcolm Brown to, let's say Gurley's not ready to go, can we expect Malcolm Brown to be like, okay, I'm going to pick up the slack here. I'm basically going to fill that C.J. Anderson role, and if Todd Gurley's not ready to go or if he's not 100%, you can lean on me, coach. I'm going to be the one ready to go because I know people are saying that Cooper Cup, just by being back, is going to help more than just the receiving game. It's going to take pressure Very off the run game because mm-hmm. they won't have to rely on two wide receivers but in Cooks and Woods. But it's not They'll like that out there passing too. game suddenly was bad. Mm-hmm. Last year about Cup, it was still it was a good just, passing. They game. lost a major weapon. That was they did, but they still got. It. Yeah, no, I get that, but they mm-hmm. still did a great job. So it's yeah. not like he's suddenly going to fix anything. Mm-hmm. Um, but does it take pressure off the run game? 
Sure, but like I'm saying, it's not like the passing game was bad when he was injured. Yeah. So I don't think there really is much pressure to let off. Well, I'm my saying point. pressure not on the pass game on the. So no, you're no, no, you're not misunderstanding. You're misunderstanding. I am. Totally I'm saying misunderstanding the here. passing game was good last year, even without Cup. So you're it was saying really that good. It was really one of the best in the NFL. Him, it's kind of like eh, it doesn't, doesn't matter. change much. Okay, it doesn't matter because it was really good, and the run game was really good, anyways, mm-hmm. too. So those two were separate things. I don't know if I made that clear at first. They were both really good. Just me going straight over my head. And I think that so I don't think it matters because they were mm-hmm. both really good. Uh, Malcolm uh, Malcolm Brown uh, and Daryl Henderson. Those two, and they drafted him like in the third round, right? Mm-hmm. So they're, they're expecting check. something out of him. Uh, and I yep. think they expect third round six pick. I think they expect that they are going to need someone to take something off of Todd Gurley. Mm-hmm. Um, and they might have a little bit of doubt about Todd Gurley. And I don't think there's anything wrong with them having a little bit of that doubt because he's in like his fourth or fifth year. Um, Fourth, well, this will be his fifth year. So he's in his fifth year. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes, like I said, these running backs, they do just fall off, especially when injuries start to happen. So they're not saying they're expecting Henderson to replace Todd Gurley, but if they want to lighten the load so that way they can make his life easier and make him last a little bit longer, because he's a guy you're going to pay big bucks for. Um, and you need to do something. And I I don't know that this is a complete replacement for C.J. Anderson, uh, but I think it helps. You know, it's gonna be something. C.J. Anderson's a monster. Mm-hmm. You can't replace C.J. Anderson, but. And the thing that I'm looking at here is, mm-hmm. so this article was from earlier this month, as we're recording this, uh, July first. Well, earlier last month, I should say, June fourteenth. Um, yeah. ESPN. They say, at the outset of the offseason program in April, the L.A. Rams running back was asked if he was prepared for an off-season of questions about his left knee. Here's what he said. I don't know, man, Gurley said. Y'all ask the questions. It's always something every off-season. Um, and then later on, the article says that, um, feeling good, Gurley said t- Tuesday at the team's training facility as he stood at the podium and responded to more questions from reporters for the first time since April um, variations of feeling good and feeling fine have been Gurley's and the Rams' go-to line when asked about his knee, which kept him sidelined for the final two games of the regular season. Feel real good, uh, Coach Sean McVay said when asked how he felt about Gurley's status looking ahead to training camp. Talking to Todd, he feels good, looks really good. I think the plan, the plan that we set out a few months back has been followed exactly the way that we need to get it done. When you hear stuff like that, like for me, I hear feeling good. It's basically like I'm saying something. It doesn't really mean anything, Mm -hmm. but I'm saying something. Or like when McVeigh goes, feel really good. I'm always feeling really good. It's like the more you say something, the less it means anything. Ricky, I'm doing good today. How are you doing? You good? I'm doing all right. It's a good podcast. It's a good episode. This is a good team. Mm -hmm. Today's a good day. It's kind of, you know, the weather's pretty good. It could be better, but it's good. To the point where you're like, well, what is good then if you're going to use it that much? You just keep saying good. Mm -hmm. To me, it's a, all right, everybody got together in a room and said, this is what we're going to say. Everything is good. (laughs) That's all right. And also Todd Gurley's like, yeah, every offseason you guys have something. To me, that's a... This is a guy that's not ready to deal with this. Mm-hmm. Like, he's not ready to handle these questions, to constantly be badgered. He's already frustrated mm-hmm. with it, as he probably should be, because he's already been getting a bunch of questions about it. Um, so there are question marks to it. And and I, yeah. without a doubt, L.A. has no idea when Todd Gurley is going to be ready. They they don't have anything in their head, but I don't think that's necessarily the worst thing in the world. This is already a really powerful offense. Looking at the schedule, mm-hmm. does it hurt them if he isn't, let's say he's not ready. To, let's say it lingers on. He's not ready to go week one. How much of him being out? What would, what, nah, what would you think would be the games where it's like, okay, if he's out this long, then I start to worry. Hmm. I don't know because I mean you've got this they open up tough to me in my it mind. It does. 
It does open up tough, and you could lose one of those first couple games, maybe mm-hmm. both of them, honestly. But, you know, you get a little bit of that Super Bowl hangover excuse. Yeah. Of, yeah, they, they've just got to get the rust off of them, and Which, they'll get their groove going. I don't think McVay is going to have his boys believe in that, though. No, like, I'm McVay saying, like, look like, everybody else. Yeah, the, the media. Yeah, they're not going to criticize it as mm-hmm. much. Um, and I honestly, I feel like he can miss a few. To me, it's once that bye week hits. He's not back by the end of the, you know, they got right in the middle. So that second half of the season, if he's not mm-hmm. back then, now I'm definitely concerned. Because if he was going to take the first half off, there's no reason why I don't think that the Rams are going to be in the playoffs. Mm-hmm. So then it's fine. He's just going to have a little bit of fresher legs in the playoffs. That it might actually be a good thing. Because the thing that I think about is we never knew exactly what the injury was. We just knew nope. he injured his left knee, We right? knew he wasn't feeling good. And. The thing that I, the thing that I think mm-hmm. of is first off, I think okay, what if it's an ACL of some sort or an MCL of some sort? That Usually, I think we would have known. That's the thing. I I think of well, then he, he wouldn't be playing on it, but mm-hmm. at the same time, would he have been playing on it if it wasn't a complete tear and it was just a um, kind of like I'm trying to think of the medical term and I'm not a doctor, but if it wasn't a complete tear. Mm-hmm. Would you still like be a able strain to almost. like a strain? Would you still be able to play on it? But Probably also, not. how long does that usually keep out? Because a torn one is usually a year. Usually, your sideline mm-hmm. for about what eight to twelve months is usually what an ACL is. And if that if it's more towards that side of things, like that severity, that means what we're probably we wouldn't see them until December. Probably because yeah, you I definitely the final think it's, it's got to be less than that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't think I don't think he had any surgeries or anything over the offseason, mm-hmm. did no, he? No, he didn't. Um, so I I don't know. It might just be one of those type of injuries where because you would think if he just tweaked it, mm-hmm. then with an entire offseason, they would be ready to go. You would think, and and maybe he will be. I don't know, but it might also be one of those injuries where part of it's in his head. Mm-hmm. Where, you know, he's kind of giving himself the yips and he's having trouble getting himself through that roadblock that's mm-hmm. up in his head now. It's just a mental roadblock? Yeah, it's possible that it could be that. Um, a lot of football is mental, mm-hmm. you know, and that's a possibility. But it's also a possibility it's a very real injury that was nagging him and he's going to be fine by week one. It's really just tough to say. What do you think of the schedule overall? Without the Todd Gurley thing, just overall, what do you think of their schedule? I mean, they're a really good team. They had a hard schedule last year, too. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they'll be fine. Do I think they're 13-3 and three this year? Probably not. Uh, but they're definitely going to be a top team in the NFC still. You know, they've got their hard parts. Like, they got to go... T- um, they got to play LA. They got to go to Carolina, to Cleveland early, to Seattle early. Mm-hmm. These are tough beginnings to the schedule, um, and it doesn't necessarily get easier. But I do think they have a little bit of a break towards the end. You know, they're going to play sh- Pittsburgh, Chicago, Baltimore, but then they get to go to Arizona. Who cares? Uh, they get to have a home game against Seattle. They get to play the Cowboys, who don't actually play better at home. Mm-hmm. Uh, 49ers, and then Arizona, you know, they get these nice five cushion games to where if they're struggling a little bit, this can kind of carry them into the playoffs. So the thing I will say, looking at last year's schedule first, all of the losses that they had were either one of two things, really good defensive team, Mm -hmm. well-disciplined team. Um, And the well-disciplined is what I throw – the Eagles into because I mean their defense isn't bad, but that defense was not on the level of the Bears or Saints last year. And even like teams like LA and Minnesota that they won, they were closer games. 35 23 for the Chargers, 38 31 for Minnesota. And I know that was one on Thursday night that I know me as a Vikings fan, like it was just a shootout. And if Jared Goff uh-huh. didn't go for five touchdowns in that game, maybe we win it. So, I mean, looking at that, I look at the schedule this year and I go, all right, there's a couple teams on here mm-hmm. that have better defenses than you played a little bit ago. Saints and Bears still have that tough defense. Um, Seahawks are an interesting one because their games were so close last year, like two and seven points last year, I believe. To where there's a possibility they could lose one of those. Mm-hmm. Um, 
You've got a team like Dallas, who is an amazing defensively, but maybe they fall into the Charger kind of territory where, hey, I know they're good defensively, but we can manage that. We can beat them. Um, so I won't put them down. But, like, Carolina really good defensively. Cleveland added some pieces defensively. Cleveland's a team in general. We don't know what we're going to get. Um, some are high, some are low. I know earlier in the podcast I said let's simmer down on the Browns, but on paper their defense is better. Yeah, they had a good defense last year. Than it was last year, and they did have a good defense last year. And even Atlanta. Atlanta, if they're healthy, that defense is really good. And Cincinnati, we don't know what we're going to get from them. Um but they had a good defense last year when they were playing really well at the beginning of the year. I just look at this team and I go, I don't think they'll be 13 and 3. Mm-mm. I wonder how many additional losses. Is it 11 and 5? Is it just a 12 and 4? Or is it a fall where it's like, holy shit, this team is 10 and 6 now? Because of Baltimore, they got to play Baltimore too. That's a pretty tough defense. I know they lost defense. Terrell Suggs, mm-hmm. but that's a pretty tough defense as well. And CJ Mosley. But yeah, but I'm not scared defense. of that offense though. Mm-hmm. Uh, and to give credit, they beat Dallas last year in the yeah. playoffs. So, but this one is an away game, so that's mm-hmm. a little different. Um, but yeah, I mean, they also and we do know have how Jason Garrett is in the playoffs. So yeah. They do also have a that Cincinnati game is somewhere. I don't really know where it's it is. It's in London. Yeah, it's a London game. So mm-hmm. there's a few things that, that throw off the Rams. But, yeah, I mean, I can easily see them, you know, falling back a little bit, but still being an 11-5 and five team this mm-hmm. year, still being right in the playoffs and kind of trying to pick back up where they were last year. Yeah, that's a London game for the Rams and the Bengals. Fun. Four, four London games this year. Mm-hmm. Um, basically the October 6th, uh, Raiders and Bears. Then you've got the, what is that? No, London, I don't want tickets. Um, October 13th, Tampa, Carolina. October 27th, Rams, Bengals. And then the November 3rd, Jaguars and Houston game will be in London. The cheapest of those is right now... You want to take a guess at which one of those games is the cheapest? Uh, London. Well, they're all in London. Oh, well, I'm, I'm talking about the Rams London Rams game. Bengals. That's, yeah. that's the one that's the cheapest. Bears, Raiders cost more. Even yeah. Bucks, Panthers cost more. It's a lot of Bears fans in London. <laughs> that's actually <laughs> not a really? joke. They really are. Oh, wow. Because of 1980, I know there's It's because of, of the 1985 Bears. I know there's also a lot of Chicago. Like, there's a lot of Cub fans in Arizona. Yeah. Well, that's a little bit. That's more of hey, we're retiring. Let's go live in yeah, Arizona. Yeah, the that one was the Bears just won their Super Bowl, mm-hmm. went to London and like got a lot of fans. Oh, okay, that so way. they did the London tour. Yeah, and got fans. Well, I mean, that they way. played a game in London and did dominated. They? Yeah. Huh. Yep. Not and, a Bears fan, so the, I don't know the, the Bears year history. after the Super Bowl. Oh, okay. Oh, so in yeah, the it's not the Super Bowl season. season. Okay. Yeah. Um. Any final thoughts on the Rams? Because I think that this is. This is one that's kind of a concise team to where we don't have to yeah. saturate. Good team them. last year, good team before that, still a good team. Are they a first round bye team? Or are they a wild card home No, game they're team? not. A, oh yeah, yeah, the home team. Yeah. yeah, I think that they're probably that home team this year. So they're 3 4. I I'm going to say 3. Yeah. Okay. You're also hoping the Bears are uh Well, Bears are number 1. They're 16 one and 0, so but this is where you guys come in. Let us know what you guys think down below. And also, if you're listening to us on podcast services around the world, let us know what you think about the entire division. Um, Cardinals, Niners, Seahawks, what are your thoughts? Make sure to hit us up on Patreon. Last shout-out to Charlie for being our new one um, at the $1 tier. Check out those tier down below. Also, follow us and sub to us, twitch.tv backslash most valuable podcast. Why not us? And then also, make sure to rate and review the Onside Kick on Apple Podcasts and iTunes. The Mark Weber, the with two E's, Mark Weber. I'm at Ricky Widmer. Most Valuable Podcast is at Most Valuable Pod. want to thank you guys for watching on YouTube. Thank you guys for listening on podcast services around the world. And as always, have a good day, everybody.